I'd like to call to order the regular meeting on December 3rd. It is 28, the year of 2018. Please join Councilmember Laura Tano in the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear Lord, as we approach this season of love and giving and peace, we ask for wisdom to lead the city for the future. We ask for a time of peace and love for our fellow man. We ask for protection for those serving abroad who will not be home for this season. We ask you to watch those that protect us at home. And we ask those that you love, uh, that we all love our fellow neighbor. In your name we pray. Well, we are all here tonight, so we have one communication item in the recognition of the former Goodyear Mayor, William Bill Arnold, for his service to our community and presentation to his wife, Mrs. Joy Arnold. I'm going to read from up here, and then I'm going to go down and call Joey forward uh, to press. So we know that this is a very special evening for Joey, and uh, Bill passed away on October 23rd. A long fight with cancer and has been missed by many ever since. Bill was elected to the city of Goodyear City Council in 1989. He also served as a mayor in 1995 until 2003. His first city government experience came in 1987 when he was elected to serve as a member of the Freeholders Board to write the Goodyear City Charter. That I did not know. A uh, very important, a uh, very important piece of paper. His leadership continued involvement and had a very positive impact on our community. And I know Joy is in a moment is going to share some words. We were at the service uh, for him, uh, and he and Ron had talked quite a bit towards the end. And so Joey was presented with a flag, and so Ron insisted to take it home uh, and have it framed. So we took it to the base. So it was done at Luke Air Force Base. Uh, and they and we're going to present that to her tonight. And then the other thing is that because uh, Bill served so long, uh, he was an eight-year um, mayor, and he did quite a number of things, and I'm not going to talk about them because Joey may say a few words, and I don't want to take anything away from uh, what she's going to say. Uh, but he was really instrumental in, in kind of setting us off. I know the YMCA, I think some parks, there were just some really unique things that he did. So I wanted to make sure we did something for him, for, for his service. So she has been meeting with us and with, with staff. And so we will be putting a bench in the Goodyear uh, City Park, Community Park in his memory. And so we brought her in, picked the place that it's going to be, uh, and we'll have that done. So I will go down now and Joey, will you come forward? I just want you to know it's a real pleasure knowing Bill. Um, and of course, a very special thing, I got to know you. Uh, and uh, you're a firecracker, we both know that. So I think you're, you're the first person I met that had a car with uh, I, la lashes on the headlights. It's a red car with lashes. Was it white? Boy, you see, I'm colorblind, huh? Yeah, so anyway, we're glad to have you here, we know how this has been for you. So I'm going to hand the microphone over to you, and we're going to hold this for you. Staff's going to take it to your car for you, but um, this is uh, what you were given the flag, and so Ron took it from you, and it, out at the base he had this made. And so, so it says to Joey Arnold, in honor of Bill Arnold, presented 3 November 2018. All right? So now you have the floor. Thank you. I just can't thank everybody enough for the city of Goodyear and uh, all the people that work here and uh, the city council and the mayor. Um, I uh, wanted to uh, tell you tonight about my journey to becoming the first lady of the city of Goodyear. I grew up in a very, very rural community in Iowa. My dad was a dirt farmer 
And um, I was out with my dad all the time, milking the cows, throwing the hay, doing all the things that farm kids do, and hence the name Joey. My real name is Joanne, but I was this old when my father called me Joey. And he called me that all the time. Everybody in school called me that, and it has just stuck with me for, for life, and I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, as I said, it was a very rural community. We did have a small town of 250 people called Plover, Iowa. And I graduated from a, a school, and I had 11 kids in my graduating class. But I was fortunate. I was a singer. And I got a music scholarship to one of the local colleges, graduated, uh, have a master's degree from the University of Minnesota because we were in northern Iowa at the Mankato campus. I came back to Iowa to teach school. I taught in Humboldt, Iowa, and that's where I met my first husband. He had just purchased a little nursing home in Humboldt, Iowa, and um, we started singing in the community chorus together, and one thing led to another, and so on and so forth. But we married, and we joined forces, and so uh, he was very, very good at putting business, the businesses of nursing homes together. And so um, we put, uh, we, we bought, uh, remodeled, reorganized, at least 36 different projects in the state of Iowa, Minnesota, and uh, Wisconsin. Um, he would do all the contracting and um, doing the business part, and we'd go to the bank and borrow the money. We'd help p other people. We did it for other people as well as for ourselves. I did all the decorating. I did all the buying of the furniture. And so when we finished a project, we called it a turnkey operation. And the administrator was in place, and the director of nurses was in place. And, uh, of course, for that, we got a fee. Well, we were doing very, very well, and we bought a home. We had a home in Iowa, but we bought a home in Scottsdale. And so we would come here whenever we could, and so on and so forth. Well, in 1984 he found a different blonde that he'd rather be married to. <laughs> so naturally, we went through a very heavy divorce because at the time we owned 16 nursing homes ourselves in the, in the state of Iowa. So there was property to, to divide. We were in court for 48 days. But he was trying to paint the picture that I was just the mere arm wife. But the judge decided, no siree, she was a full partner in this business because we had all the witnesses and videos and all this kind of stuff. And anyway, I was devastated, but um, I could have the home in Iowa without mortgage or I could have the home in Scottsdale with mortgage. I took the one in Scottsdale with mortgage. But I also was awarded seven of the nursing homes. I formed my own company. I ran them for 10 years. Then I moved to Scottsdale permanently in 1998. And I thought, well, girl, what are you going to do? Well, there's only thing, one thing I really knew how to do. I wasn't going to go back to teaching school again. So I decided I wanted to build a nursing home. I didn't like what I saw in Arizona. But anyway, um, I met this guy who worked for Phoenix uh, Memorial Hospital, and he was very persuasive. And he said, well, I've got some land out here. We've got some land out here in Goodyear. And I said, OK, I'll take a look at it. Well, we drove and drove and drove and drove. <laughs> and here we are out in this cotton field. And he said, now there's going to be a hospital built there next year. I said, oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know where I got the guts, but I sold everything I had in Iowa, put my heart and soul, and built the Palm Valley Rehab and Care Center. 
I borrowed $14 million to do it. And guess what? The hospital didn't get built for four years. And that is one of our best. One of the things that people don't know about Palm Valley is that it has seven courtyards within the building. So everyone that is a patient there or a resident there has a window to look outside uh, to some landscaping. Um, well, there was this, of course, nobody knew me in Goodyear. I mean, I'm from Iowa, and, and um, so I joined the Chamber of Commerce, and I joined the Rotary, and I joined all these things so that people would get to know me and that I was running, which really isn't a very popular business, as you might expect, uh, uh, no, but um, I had to get patients in to pay for this $14 million building that I was sitting in. And pretty soon we got one, and then pretty soon we got two. But at the ribbon cutting, here came the mayor to cut the ribbon, of course. And I'd seen him at various other things, but he was always with a woman. So I thought, he's married. So one day, at um, uh, I was at work, and one of my employees came, and we were talking about it at lunch or something. She says, Bill Arnold? No, he's divorced. So I thought, woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we were having a big dinner, a Valentine dinner dance for the residents and their families and for the staff and their families. And I thought, hmm, I think it'd be pretty special to invite the mayor to kind of say a few words, don't you? <laughs> so I called him up at his office here uh, at the uh, city. And I said, um, would you like to come to our Valentine dinner dance at Palm Valley Rehab? And um, all this time, I didn't know, but Bill was a runner and he was a bike rider. And he had been uh, riding his bike and running around the area where Palm Valley is. It's right next door to Obrazo Hospital. Um, and he thought, hmm, I think I better get to know this little blonde that's building this big building in my city. And so he came, and I very strategically put him, uh, sat him at uh, the table where we had a 100-year-old lady and she danced, and oh, they were all dressed up, and it was just a wonderful evening. And ever since then, we started dating. And of course, dating the mayor and being seen around town with the mayor and going to all the functions that the mayor goes to uh, didn't hurt my business any either. <laughs> so that was very helpful to me. And so uh, five, and a half, five and a half years later, we. Uh, he was mayor, and then he was in the House of Representatives for a couple years, and we really got to go on a lot of fun trips to Washington, D.C., and to the Karshner Caverns, and oh, many, many trips. And I really enjoyed being the first lady of Goodyear, I can tell you that. Um, but um, in 2013, I had an opportunity and so I sold the property here in Goodyear, and then Bill and I moved to Pebble Creek. And um, we were lived there about a year, and uh, he was diagnosed with lymphoma. And he um, was bad, and he would get treatment, then he would get better. Then he was bad, and he'd get treatment, and he was better. And some of you were at his 80th birthday at Dino's patio, and he was really good that night, really, really good. But shortly after that, he started getting weaker and weaker. And um, the last wave, uh, we, ha oh, we had planned to, uh, to, we had bought into La Loma. Uh, it's the only life care community in our area. And um, he, uh, he was very tickled about it. We have a nice, big, spacious two-bedroom uh, apartment. And um, we put our house up for sale. And um, then the last wave of lymphoma, he just was too weak. He, he just, he couldn't handle it anymore. But he 
was at peace because he, he felt that I was going to be taken care of. So uh, our house is up for sale if anybody's interested. <laughs> We have, we have a beautiful, beautiful view of the western skies of the western mountains and so on, where Bill used to take me hiking in the white tanks, and he took me on the Mare's Trail and the Australia's hiking. Um, I can tell you that he was one of the most wonderful people I have ever met in my entire life. He, I was telling Georgia the other day uh, and some of the other members, I never heard him say one negative thing about anybody in his entire life. He was such a kind, kind, polite person. And even though he was divorced, he insisted that he and his former wife stayed close together so that the, their sons would have a good upbringing. And he has insisted that in his sons, and they have done the same. And he just comes from such a solid, solid, good background. And um, we were married on my 65th birthday, and we were married 13 and a half years, so you can figure it out. <laughs> but uh, anyway, thank you. I feel so honored to be able to be here tonight. I feel so honored with the flag. I feel so honored with the bench that you're going to put in the city park. And I just want to thank the council and Mayor, Mayor Lord and Ron and just thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being so kind to me. But one, one last thing I'd like to say is Bill loved a good year. He just loved to see it grow, and he loved to do all the projects that he did. And I can tell you, I love Goodyear, too. Thank you for your patience. Sometimes things are worth it. All right, we're going to go. Is there time for citizens who would like to address the city council on any non-agenda items? Do we have any cards? No, ma'am. All right, with that, we're going to go right then um, to the consent agenda. 
to approve the agenda, will the city clerk please read consent agenda item 6.1 through 6.7 by title only, please. 6.1, approval of minutes. 6.2, approve an enhanced traffic signal at Estrella Parkway and San Miguel Drive. 6.3, approve a grant and aid agreement with the Tohono O'odham Nation. 6.4, approve the replat for Cantamia Track 2, Phase 2, and Track 1, Phase 3. 6.5, approve the replat for Cantamia Parcel 31. 6.6, approve the replat for Cantamia Parcel 42. 6.7, approve the replat for Cantamia Parcels 32 to 34. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? No, ma'am. Does anyone in the audience uh, want to speak? All right. Does anyone in the council wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? Council Member Stipp. Mayor, I'd like to remove item 6.2 for a full presentation. You want a presentation? Well, then, if it may, could we take a motion for 6.1, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7? So Would moved. you make the motion? Sure. All right. All right, motion was made from Councilman Stipp and Vice and Vice Mayor the second. So could I have a motion and a second? I have that. So roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Campbell? Aye. Council Member Pazillo? Aye. Council Member Loritano? Aye. Council Member Stipp? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, so it looks like we're gonna have a presentation on six point two. Rebecca? All right, and um, uh, hello, Mayor Lord and council members. Um, and just, I would like to start out by saying, um, I apologize, I probably should have put this on business so that I could do a presentation because I think that it is important for you to have an opportunity to hear about this particular signal and the considerations that were uh, made. So I'm just going to quickly run over the agenda that I'm going to uh, have this evening. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, two other CIP traffic signals, just to let you know that this particular signal is part of um, three signals that are being constructed this fiscal year. We're going to talk about the existing conditions at that intersection, as well as the options that we considered um, within the engineering department and with our partners within the city. I will provide you with a recommendation from myself and then really ultimately seek policy direction from council. Uh, so again, um, this is one of three signals that are being constructed this year. We have the signal also at Camelback and 146, which is currently under construction. You may not see work happening in the field, but we've already had a pre-construction meeting and we've begun to order the poles for that. Uh, that signal is an ADOT style as well. We also have the signal at Perryville and Indian School. Uh, that is currently in the preliminary stages of design. We will be coming forward in January, possibly February, with an IGA with the county because that is on our border, and so it'll be a participation with them as well as with uh, the SEDEA development. That also is an ADOT style uh, poll. And then we have the San Miguel and Estrella, and tonight we will seek policy direction on that. It is in the vicinity, um, in the boundaries that were set forth in August of 2016 to be a modular uh, signal. So this map, just to give us a little bit of context of, of where this signal is, is located, it is the green dot on the map to the right. It's at San Miguel and Estrella. There's a modular pole to the north at Elliott and Estrella, and then a modular pole to the south at West Star Drive and Estrella. Those are both about three quarters to a mile separation from the existing pole we're talking about at the green dot. In addition, there's a couple other signals up at the Elliott and San Miguel, I'm sorry, Elliott and Estrella location. We have one that we call the Walgreens signal and then another one at San Gabriel and Elliott. The blue boundary shown on the south edge of this map, that was the original boundary that was set um, in August of 2016. So everything north of that was determined to be a modular signal and everything south of that would be the A dot style. <clears throat> Just wanted to give a couple photographs. If you're uh, standing at the San Miguel, San Miguel and Australia signal looking north, you have no visibility of the Elliott signal. 
I just wanted to provide some context because in some locations on some of our roads, you can stand and see two or three signals in, in uh, close proximity. Uh, it just so happens that San Miguel, uh, this intersection is in a low point and there's also a, a horizontal curvature both to the north and to the south. So this is your visibility, apologize for the photograph, uh, but this is your uh, visibility to the south toward the West Star Drive signal. So again, uh, no visibility of the signal. Uh, this uh, pictorial is to give you just a quick view of the intersection in question. Uh, it is currently a three-legged intersection. Uh, there are existing utilities throughout the intersection and the area that has uh, brought concern to us is located in that southwest corner of the intersection. I have highlighted it uh, circled in red. There are, um, there's a gas line, electric fiber. Those are normal utilities that we find in that vicinity because we have a PUE or a public utility easement. But in addition to those, we have two ACP water lines. One is an irrigation line and then one is one of our water lines. Both were constructed um, about 30 years ago. And uh, just to um, give the, the ACP is asbestos some, uh, cement pipe. And so um, th those types of pipes uh, are no longer used in construction, but we have existing um, pipes that are in the ground. Uh, this type of, um, these two pipes are located between 10 and 15 feet deep. And the ACP pipe is a very brittle uh, pipe and that when um, it's, it's satisfactory to keep it in place, but once you begin to touch it or cut it or move it, uh, you need to bring on an asbestos mitigation contractor because there are some concerns with this type of pipe once you cut it. Uh, but certainly all of that can be worked through. So the first option that we considered is the first of three. It's our typical Goodyear modular signal. Sig signal. This is uh, the view of uh, McDowell and uh, Pebble Creek Parkway. Um, <clears throat> if we were to install this signal in its normal location, the foundation of the modular pole is six and a half feet by four feet we would certainly have to relocate the utilities in the area to include the two ACP pipes. Uh, and um, that uh, the, the length of the arm is also 50 feet, uh, which could become um, visually confusing. It is certainly not a safety issue. We have this um, located throughout the city of Goodyear. It's just um, sometimes a, a I guess an irritant to the driver when it's not uh, directly over the lanes. And I'm just using this uh, picture here to show you, this is a particular example where when you're driving, uh, you see that the uh, left turn arrows are not directly over the left turn lanes. Again, no safety concerns with this at all. It's just more of a visual, um, visual issue. The second option we looked at was the good, a Goodyear modular signal and a median pole. The reason for this is again, we met in the field with, um, with public works, with engineering, with CIP manager, uh, with the Newland um, folks, because we wanted to look at all of the opportunities and constraints that we had in the field. And we thought if we could take the main pole of the modular um, signal and move it further to the west so that we did not have to uh, relocate those ACP lines, that would be an opportunity for us. However, because of the limited arm length, the um, arm would not sufficiently uh, cover the lanes. So we would have to add a median pole, but certainly an option for us. We do have one other location in the city where we, have, we use median poles. That's at Monte Vista and Pebble Creek. Now you will see median poles at the um, interchanges with ADOT and our roadways, but that's simply because the mouth of the um, intersection is large enough so that you would need to have um, a pole for better visibility. Plus when you go underneath the, say the I-10 or the 303, the median pole sits lower so you can visually see it before you can sometimes see the, the regular signal poles. But this is an atypical use, but it is certainly an option for us. 
The third option we considered was the enhanced ADOT signal. Uh, with this signal, the, um, the base of the pole is only three foot in diameter. So there are limited conflicts, either limited or no conflicts at all. Again, we would have to do the final design. Uh, and then with the increased arm length of 65 feet, there are no concerns about it um, being um, over the appropriate lanes. Uh, with that, I'd just like to um, uh, provide you estimated costs. Now again, keep in mind these are estimated because uh, steel um, is ever changing, mm -hmm. um, but for uh, based on what we have um, been able to gather together, the modular signal at this location, including the um, the the pardon me, the ACP line relocation and the two other um, relocations of utilities is about 700,000. Modular plus a median pole, and again, modular. this modular moved further to the west so as not to impact the ACP lines, we estimate at 550,000, and the enhanced ADOT signal at 400,000. Now keep in mind, and I've said this in prior um, conversations, it's simply because the ADOT signal has less steel. That's why it's less costly. Um, so the funding for this particular project does not come from the general fund. It is actually funded through the 2014 Street South Impact Fee. That current balance is just over 700,000. So this is not a funding issue. I wanna make sure that that's clear. It's a funding is a consideration, but it's certainly not an issue. Right now, the approved budget sits at 553,500. If we were to um, select the, uh, the typical modular, modular sign, uh, signal, we would need to transfer funds, but it's, again, no issue. We would work through finance and transfer those funds for this. I would like to note, though, that the unused 2014 IIP funds that would be remaining, if there were any, would be moved to the new IIP to offset those costs. Uh, with that said, and this is, is my recommendation, um, uh, because I believe that that is my role here at the City of Goodyear, is to truly um, look at uh, the issues that come before us. And I realize that I have policy direction from you, but I feel that I should provide you this information to see if you would like to reaffirm your policy direction or alter it. But in this case, I would like to say that I recommend the use of an ADOT style traffic signal for a variety of uh, reasons, including uh, visibility of adjacent signals, the utility relocation cost and timing, proximity to the boundary to the south, as well as support from EMR and Newland. With that said, I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Are there any, I, I gather there's no speaker cards, so we'll go. Could I have a motion and second to approve the enhanced traffic signal? Do I hear a motion? Second. I heard a motion from Vice Mayor Campbell and a second from Councilman Brazillo. Open for council discussion. Councilman uh, Stiff. Rebecca, thanks for the detail of the presentation. <clears throat> Sorry. And, um, and I appreciate your position of obviously making an engineering recommendation. Um, with a whole lot of, uh, I think, good good reason why why it was suggested. Um, the it, the concern that I have about this is we've got an opportunity to maintain some consistency down the main route in and around Estrella Parkway. Um, we've got the modular lights at two very small, I don't even want to call them intersections, but the Walgreens light and then the other light at Star Pass. Those are modular lights. We've got a modular light uh, north of this one. We've got a modular light south of this one. This is smack dab in the middle of a series of traffic lights. And we're going to lose that consistency that we, that I thought we had come to. And you pointed out we agreed that the southern boundary is the southern boundary and then it'll change from there. The other lights that you uh, mentioned early in the presentation, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any issue with the consistency, even to the point of the one that we put up on Thomas mm -hmm. um, because of its proximity to the lights in Avondale, which are, uh, which are different. I'm okay with that one too. This particular light is going to disrupt that consistency. And one of the things that um, 
people are most comfortable with in our community is the quality of our of our built community and this adds to that now of course there's an expense that goes with that and as i pointed out before sometimes it's okay to spend money to do the right thing and if this traffic configuration with the smaller module and the pole is 550 i think is what you said correct est estimated mm -hmm. and the budget for this is 553 we have the money to do and keep the consistency and um i'd like i'd like us to move move in in that in that direction um and that was that was my concern and i greatly appreciate the uh, uh the presentation um for my council um partners i want you to know i fired this question off on friday so they had plenty of advance notice uh which is not what i've done in the past so um but i really appreciate it and that was my concern is the inconsistency that we're creating and we're already outside of the boundaries of the quote unquote policy direction that we established. So um, I ask for council consideration to go in the other direction. Councilor Vizzillo. Can you back up one slide? Sure. This one or? Yes, that's okay. perfect. I have no problem with your recommendation and here's why that last bullet point, EMR Newland support, if that, that's correct. <coughs> I'm looking at Newland there. Uh, when it comes to taxpayers' money, I, understand, I can appreciate consistency, but 150000 is $150,000. And I really don't have a problem with the ADOT lights, even if they're mixed up, because I think they look nice. Um, they're well, you know, the color of them, the visibility, because of the longer arm on there. And I like saving $150,000 for our taxpayers. So I appreciate the recommendation, and I'm in support of your recommendation. Councilmember Laura Chano. I, I am also in support of the recommendation. It has very little to do with the, the difference in, in, in the money. I, I am glad that EMR, you know, obviously Newland supports it, which is very important. But as a resident up there and driving that intersection quite a bit to go to high school, there's a couple things that I look at as a different perspective. Having a new driver on the road in about 16, yeah, 16 days who's <laughs> going to be driving to that high school, it's going to be very important. I think it's not to cause confusion because there's a lot of kids that are going to drive to that high school and do every year. Um, having the light go all the way over, I think, is very, very important uh, as a parent, you know, on that roadway because it's a very dark roadway. Um, and the, the light right now, I'm glad we're putting enough light there because of the three-way three, three -way stop is, is just, it just backs up. Um, so that, and then I am fine with it. I think there is consistency. They're the same color. It's the same palette. I personally think it's better for up there because it's not so bulky and industrial and it doesn't block the mountains as you're driving. Um, the lettering is fine. It's easy to see. It's going to be well lit and it's going to be easy for people to, to follow. So uh, I think it is, does consistent. You know, if it was green and then you've got a brown one, then, then I have a little problem there. But it's brown with the green sign. It's going to match. It's going to blend right in. No one's going to know. Um, and I, I like the fact it's going to go over all the lanes. That's really important to me. So I like that. So I support your recommendation. Vice Mayor? I support your recommendation too, Rebecca, because seriously, when you look at uh, EMR, it's, it's different than downtown Goodyear or down where we are. If you look at their light poles, they're not the same light poles we have, but they look fine. And I think that using the ADOT light is not going to detract from it. It's just going to blend in. And it's much needed at that intersection, as Council Member Laurentano said. The kids are driving that every day. I don't think they'll pay attention to the great big, they won't know which lane is what arrow. Trust me, they're, they're new drivers. And and uh, I just think it's really important that, that um, we go with what EMR and Newland wants. And so I'm in favor of your suggestion. Council Member Kano. I'm also in favor of your suggestion uh, because of the uh, covering of the lanes. I know that I'm frequently making a left turn um, on Pebble Creek Parkway onto McDowell and it doesn't line up. And sometimes I have to, am I in the right lane in the right place? And so I think that lane alignment to me is a critical factor. Just out of curiosity, the ACP pipes, if they are left alone, is there longevity? going to remain intact. I mean, we're, there's nothing that would need to be done with them anytime soon. Absolutely. They will remain intact. Thank you. Well, I'm the last. Oh, I didn't know you want to speak, Council Member. I can speak. Mm -hmm. I'm in favor as well. Thank you. <laughs> in favor. Okay. Um, well, 
I trust you. You've been a mm -hmm. great engineer. I thought you told a great story tonight. You were specific about each of them, uh, and I greatly appreciate that. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Loritano? Aye. Councilmember Stipp? Nay. Councilmember Hampton? Aye. Councilmember Kano? Aye. Councilmember Frazillo? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. Great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. All right, let's go on to the business. We have uh, at 7.1 on business to conduct a public hearing to receive a comment on the proposed development impact fees to support the infrastructure improvement plan, which was approved October 22nd. I'm going to open the public hearing and our finance manager, Lori Wigginroth, will present it. Lori? Thank you, it's nice to be back. Uh, as you know, we're now in the fee process phase of the impact fee adoption. Uh, just kind of uh, this, the, this process began for staff well over a year ago. It was in November, the first time the consultant came to start this process. So just uh, to remind you, we've gone through a number of council meetings, work sessions, uh, stakeholder meetings. Uh, uh, you approved the infrastructure plan that uh, supports the fees that we're now looking at. And we've followed the state statutory requirements of having posted these fees. And this is the next step that is required by state statutes for you to hold this public hearing. Um, just a quick summary of these are the same fees that uh, you saw, uh, 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 you've seen the last few times we've been here talking about, about this. The, your North residential fees, I, uh, are presented here, the current ones, as well as the ones that are posted for your approval in January. Um, and just a reminder on this particular area, in the new plan, we're combining what's currently the north and central areas so that there is simply a north area rather than two separate areas. And I'll note that on this particular slide, police is shown, it's also on the next, it is a citywide fee, so it's the same in both areas. And so here are your south fees. Again, the same ones that we've seen uh, uh, for the single family residences. And then we've been using these particular uh, items as our comparison of our current fees and the future fees for the non-residential uh, items. And again, uh, no changes from the last time you've seen this. Uh, next steps after today's public hearing are that on January 14th, you're scheduled to act to adopt these fees. Uh, there is a minimum 75 day waiting period from when the fees are approved before they can go into effect, uh, which would put the fees in effect on April 1st. Uh, and then as we've discussed previously, the statute does provide moratoriums that protect uh, certain entities uh, if they've got, uh, if they already have pro projects at a certain point in the process, uh, they may have up to 24 months of the current fees before any new fees that are increased go into effect. We do have one fee that's decreasing. <coughs> that particular fee would go into effect immediately for everybody. And with that, I'd ask you to uh, hold the public <coughs> hearing. Thank you very much. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? All right, I'm gonna close the public hearing. And the next item is to conduct a public hearing to, oh, well, is that it? There's no action needed. It was no just action? a public hearing. Okay, because I'm sitting here and they're going into this. It, 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 it alarmed me a little bit. So we're going to 7.2, correct? All right, thank you. On uh, 7.2 is to conduct a public hearing regarding the approval of a new Class A bingo license for Pebble Creek Ladies Golf Association. I'm gonna open the public hearing. Elisa Magley, City Clerk Specialist, will present it. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So I'm here to present a Class A bingo license which was submitted by Kitty Day. You're gonna have to speak a little bit closer Sorry. to that microphone. Thank you. Tried to get it there. Okay, is that better? So for Kitty Day, Chairwoman for the Pebble Creek Ladies Golf Association. Bingo is regulated by the Arizona Department of Revenue and requires a municipal hearing to take place for any new bingo license, regardless of type, within 45 days of receipt of the application. This application was received on November 16th, making our deadline December 31st. <clears throat> Anyone who conducts games of bingo with prizes and charges players to play bingo must obtain a license. The City Council's recommendation will be forwarded to the Arizona Department of Revenue. 
and the state does not begin their process without the city's approval. <clears throat> the Pebble Creek Ladies Golf Association plans to host bingo games during a golf tournament on April 8th, 2019 from 5 to 8 p.m. Six games, $5 per card, and they plan on returning all the money to the winners. There is not a temporary bingo license that they could have applied for, so therefore they applied for the Class A license, which enables them to host bingo for a year before requiring renewal. There are three different types of bingo licenses, mostly for tax purposes, and the Class A, they cannot exceed $15,600 in gross receipts for the year. This application was reviewed by the Police Department and Development Services, and they have no comment. And I'm more than happy to take any questions. And I also have a representative here if I can't answer any of them. All right. Thank you. Does the applicant want to speak? Mm -hmm. Oh, fine. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? And is there anybody else in the audience who might want to speak? All right. Then I'm going to close the public hearing. Is there a motion and second to approve the Class A bingo <coughs> license? So moved. Second. I heard a motion by Vice Mayor Campbell and a second by Councilman Gazillo. I got it right, huh? No, oh. it was still Z. Okay. It was still. I looked at Z, though. I did it again. Did I? <laughs> I cannot go at least one meeting to do that. Um, all right, so we both, we have a motion and a second. Open for council discussion. I, Councilman Hanson. No, I, I think it's a good thing. I just had a question about the how it works so they can't make more than 15,000 a year or on each game year. correct for a year so okay so not benefit back to them they can only the fundraising can only be 15,000 at a cap essentially so what it is is they can accept in gross receipts um, but their plan is to return all the money to the <coughs> winners so it's just but it's the class of the type so they can't, of the bingo license okay so the association can't make more than fifty thousand off of the games, but Correct. if they but they if they raise thirty thousand dollars, then it would go right back to the people that did it. Yeah, that was that were part point. of the game. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other vice mayor? And in disclosure, I am a member, an associate member of the ladies um, eighteen hole golf course. I think, and um, I will not benefit from this because I do not play in this tournament, and they plan on doing one bingo game in one tournament. And I'm so sorry they have to go through all these hoops so that we could play bingo. <laughs> but thank you very much. <coughs> all right, no more discussion. Let's vote on it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you bingo. very much. Thank you. All right, 7.3. The next item, we consider. It's fine. I'm sorry, do you have something to say? No, all right. Let's go to 7.3 to consider approving an extension of the Pebble Creek Marketplace final plat. Planning Manager, Katie Wilkin, presenting. Katie? Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. The Pebble Creek Marketplace development is located at the southwest corner of McDowell Road and Pebble Creek Parkway along the I 10 interstate. The proposed final plat would subdivide 29 acres into eight lots and one track to facilitate commercial development of the site. The final plat was approved on August 20th, 2018. According to the subdivision regulations, uh, an extension may be considered by city council. <coughs> the staff has reviewed the extension request against the subdivision regulation criteria and found that it has met that criteria and recommends approval of the extension to the final plat. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. The applicant is also here. Um, right. happy Does to the applicant questions. want to speak? I don't. <laughs> no, fine. He's not, oh, he's going to speak. All right. Um, my name is Howard Grace with the WM Grace Company. Uh, we're the developer of the project. Um, Part of our need is we've subdivided uh, the property for a number of users, which includes Panera Bread, uh, uh, Babbo's Italian restaurants. Um, uh, we've got some minor paperwork we need to do. We hope to start construction fairly quickly. I think the plat is a 90-day extension, but we would we need your plat to to give us the approval to get some utility easements and some other things that need to be done. But we hope to be under construction in January. So. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. 
I need a motion and a second to approve the extension of the Pebble Creek Marketplace final plat. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, so moved, I didn't get that. Was that Councilman Hampton? It was the motion, the second was Vice Mayor. Open for council discussion. Councilman Pazillo. I don't have any question, but I wanna thank uh, Mr. Grace for coming in and spending, I guess, about an hour with a, with a couple of us going over all the details. Uh, I had originally had a concern. I wanna make sure that there was a certain piece on that property that wasn't holding things up. And, and um, he assured me uh, the layout of the plan, how they were gonna move forward. And uh, again, as I ended the meeting, remember I just said in the immortal worlds of Larry, the cable guy, just get her done, okay? <laughs> and I appreciate all your efforts, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it, congratulations. All right, let's go to 7.4. Just a moment. The last item is to uh, consider amending sections of the city code relating to code enforcement. Christopher Baker, Development Services, Director presenting. Christopher? Good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, I know it's been a long evening, so I'm not going to make a real long presentation. I do not have a PowerPoint. Um, so I'm just going to kind of be brief and then be available for any questions that you may have. So thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity tonight to present some proposed revisions to city code. Uh, but before I begin, I'd just like to publicly thank uh, Assistant City Attorney Lisa Maxie Mullins and our Neighborhood Services Director or Coordinator uh, Christina Plant for their collaboration and input into this process in order to make things more effect, effective and efficient for our citizens. So as the council knows, uh, the city code compliance division enforces city codes and seeks, and most importantly, seeks voluntary compliance with those codes. Voluntary compliance works best and we achieve great outcomes when we take that approach. However, there are cases and issues that take place in the city where we have what we call repeat offenders, where there's property owners that have the same issues over and over and over again. The repeat offender issue creates frustration for the public. It subjects citizens to ongoing issues, creates the perception of neglect in our neighborhoods, creates unresolved code compliance matters, creates non-value added work for our code compliance officers who are dealing with the same issues over and over again with the same uh, properties. And it does not use city personnel and resources very efficiently. But before I get to the, th to the essential three components of the revision tonight, I just wanna briefly highlight what the current process is. So when our office either receives a complaint from a citizen or the code division observes a complaint or a violation, the very first step is to issue an advisory notice. That is an effort to educate citizens and property owners about city codes and how they can voluntarily come into compliance. So after that, there's an inspection that's set for 10 days later. At that point, if the matter is cleared up, the case is closed and everything moves forward. If it's not complete, then it goes to the second step which is called a notice of violation. Again, there's another inspection that's sent 10 days later to give the property owner opportunity to rectify the situation. Again, if it's rectified, the case is closed. If it's not rectified, it goes to the third step, which is what we call the final notice. So this is your last opportunity to come into compliance. Again, there's another inspection set 10 days after that. And then if it's resolved, the case is closed. If not, a citation is issued and court is set 30 to 45 days later. So that's a lot of words, a lot of process. And essentially it can take uh, about three and a half to four months for that process to work through. So you can imagine if you uh, were a neighbor to an ongoing repetitive issue um, that this type of process could be very cumbersome and very frustrating to you. Sometimes our repeat offender customers use this process and this timeline I just outlined for you as uh, an opportunity to delay enforcement and delay action, They're, therefore creating even more frustration. So tonight we're proposing some modifications to city code uh, in order to more efficiently and effectively deliver city services and deal with uh, code violations and specifically with repeat offenders. So there's three changes. Change number one 
is that if a code violation does go to court and the owner was previously found responsible, so that they went to court and the judge said you are responsible for this violation, and they end up in court again on the same violation, the fee, the fine structure increases. So there's greater penalties associated with that. That's the first change. The second change, uh, and this is the most important change, I believe, <laughs> creates a new and very clear mechanism to address repeat offenders. And what it does is it sets forth the following. If you are a property owner and you receive a notice of violation, you have two opportunities within a two-year time frame. If you receive a third notice of violation on that same topic, the code officer can just immediately issue you a citation and you would just go directly to court. So that would save three to four months out of this process for just the repeat offenders. Now I'll use an example. If you have weeds on your property and you go through this and you get two notices of violation, say you're sick or out of town, they'll continue to work with you. Um, if you have a separate violation on your property, such as maybe an inoperable vehicle, that doesn't trigger the immediate citation because that's a separate topic. So just we want to, again, educate our citizenry about uh, city codes and work with them to come into voluntary compliance. The third and uh, last change that is proposed is just to clear up some language associated with the abatement process and how the city recovers those funds. If we, have to, if we go through that abatement process and we spend city funds to clean up weeds or uh, so forth, we do ultimately, and if we're not paid back, we would place a lien against the property. So that's the third change, just to make sure that the city does recoup its funds. So in conclusion, the proposed amendments still preserve our commitment to educate our citizenry about city codes and to obtain voluntary compliance. The changes make it clear that an owner, if an owner is found responsible by court that for two violations that the the fines and penalties could increase. The changes also make it clear that code can more effectively and efficiently deal with repeat offenders by allowing code officers to issue citations immediately with, on the same violation. The, the changes to proposed changes will also re result in faster response, faster neighborhood cleanup, faster property cleanup, that um, and solve issues that plague some properties repeatedly over and over and over again. And most importantly, I'll say that this change would, would make us more efficient in dealing with citizen complaints and continuing our appearance of a very high quality city. So with that, Mayor, I'm done with my presentation and available for any questions. Thank you very much. We're gonna do this in two votes because we have the resolution, we have the ordinance, so. Would the speaker clerk please read resolution 2018-1921 by title only, please? Adopt resolution number 2018-1921 declaring as a public record that certain document filed with the city clerk entitled amendments to section 10-6-1, enforcement penalties, 10-6-2, compliance abatement notice, and 10-6-4, abatement by city of chapter 10, health and sanitation of the Goodyear city code. Thank you. Could I have a motion, a second, to adopt resolution 2018-1921? So moved. Second. I heard a motion by Councilman Kano and a second by Councilman Vasillo. Open for council discussion. No discussion. All in uh, roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Campbell. Aye. Council Member Stepp. Aye. Council Member Hampton. Aye. Council Member Kano. Aye. Council Member Pizzillo. Aye. Council Member Loretano. Aye. Mayor Lord. Aye. The motion carries. All right, we'll go to the second one. Will the city clerk please read ordinance 2018-1419 by title only, please? Adopt ordinance number 2018-1419, amending and replacing sections 10-6-1, enforcement penalties, 10-6-2, compliance abatement notice, and 10-6-4, abatement by city of chapter 10, health and sanitation of the Goodyear city code and providing for penalties, repeal of conflicting ordinances and codes, corrections, severability, and an effective date. Thank you. Can I have a motion and a second to adopt ordinance 2018-1419? So moved. Second. I heard a motion by Vice Mayor Campbell, a second by Council Member Stipp. Uh, open for council discussion. No discussion, roll call vote please. Vice Mayor Campbell. Aye. Council Member Hampton. Aye. Council Member Kano. Aye. Council Member Pizzillo. Aye. Council Member Loretano. Aye. Council Member Stipp. Aye. Mayor Lord. Aye. The motion carries. 
is. We're at the end. So information items, council, do you have anything reports, anything you want to talk about? No? All right. City I do. Yeah. Oh, you do. A template for the holidays. A template for the holidays yeah. in the menorah. Yeah. yeah. Well, you do the menorah. I'll do well, the template. Start. No, I'm going to do the last thing. Whoever wants to start, go ahead. I will start with home plate for the holidays. All right. I think the city did a wonderful job. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you, everybody, who helped with that. That was absolutely wonderful. I think everyone had a great time. A big crowd. We saw Santa, and a lot of us, we were all there. And we don't sing that well, but that's okay. <laughs> it was fun. It's a great, it was a great event. Yes. Anybody on this side? Yes, Councilman Hannah. I'll take the menorah. Pardon? Take the, I went to the Hanukkah, lighting of the menorah at uh, Osborne, so it was good. Kid, my kid took my kids and they, they loved it. They had a guy doing a science I saw your little there. girl dancing and we were very controlled with her. You let her twirl so she kept herself silent. By yeah, the, she, by was, she was dancing. She's been taking princess <laughs> ballerina classes, so she's <laughs> <laughs> fairy tale dancing. So, so, yeah, she's all about dancing right now. But, yeah, so it was a good time. I thought it was good for the kids. And, yeah, uh, yeah a lot of people there enjoyed it. So, right. Yeah, good time. Hi, sir. Do you have anything? Do my oh, uh, why don't I do yeah, this? Can you right. We're going to do it, and then I'm going to let Wally do it. Councilman Kano? There are two traffic cabinets that are having public art done right now. Um, I had the opportunity to stop by on Sunday to watch Bonnie Lewis and her team of young people mm -hmm. painting the cabinet on 144th Ave in Indian School. And then I've stopped by a couple times to see Carson Greer working at the Goodyear Community Park. And just want to give a shout out to Councilman Fazillo for championing the, uh, the traffic uh, cabinet project. And it's... Um, the art is great, so drive by and see these things. Yeah, it's really, um, it's doing a fantastic job. Any other over here? Yes, Council Mister. Uh, just a quick update um, on the Prop 400 transportation meeting that uh -huh. you and I had uh, with the staff. That was a great meeting. Um, what we were able to, just for everyone else's benefit, what we're able to figure out is MAG is working in one parallel Valley Metro is working in, in a separate category. Uh, and there, uh, through the course of this meeting, we realized that there's a tremendous amount of overlap in both transportation from a road network and a transit perspective. Uh, and I thought that was really important. So appreciate the work of uh, the manager and all the staff to uh, facilitate that and get it and get it done. I think it was very helpful for me, for sure. And yeah, it was for me, too. I think it's good. It brought to mind that if you're on a committee and um, they, they start to discuss out of information outside of the committee, and it's, but it's pertinent information you want to bring back to the city, uh, so you can meet with council and you can meet with staff and discern where you should be in that discussion. So it, it, it does help. Anything else here? No. All right. Oh, Phil, I'm sorry. That's okay. You've raised your hand twice. Uh, the, again, kudos to the uh, home plate for the holidays. Um, like I say, we're probably not the greatest singers up there on staff, but again, we had a great time. Uh, I was able to get to the menorah, but my next greatest joy other than this job here is I got to see my uh, granddaughter in concert over in Scottsdale with the Phoenix Children's Chorus, and they did a fantastic job, so. I always got to put a plug in. You know that for my granddaughter. So that I enjoyed very much this weekend. Well, home plate for the holidays was spectacular. And there was some, do we know what the count was? Oh, you're going to get, I won't, I won't, I'm not going to tread on that. But it, we just really enjoyed it. And it, we're just growing up. <laughs> Gets bigger and bigger, more people, and it's pretty terrific. But everybody was laughing and dancing and having a great time. So you have the floor, city manager. Oh, and did you? Oh, no, you don't. Just a moment. Yeah. She has said this three times to me tonight. Uh, Wally okay. has a presentation. All right. Today. We waited till the end. So. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to say that this morning, the Pebble Creek Home Tour Committee made up of four of us, Charlotte Krauss, Barbara Hockert, and Suzanne Butler and myself, presented Chief Geyer with a check for $12,110 for Shop with the Cop. And that was all the proceeds from a four-hour home tour that we conducted in November in Pebble Creek. So I want to thank the homeowners and the committee for wonderful work. Now I have another presentation that I want to make to Chief Luigi. 
Um, as all of you know, we're involved in the Good Your Fill and Eat program, and it was established and supported by city employees 16 years. To date, the Fill and Eat program has served over 600 Goodyear families and about 1,800 children. Donations are received by city employees and community businesses and organizations to fund this wonderful, wonderful event. This year, in 2018, we plan to have 30 Goodyear families and over 100 children as the people, as the families that we are going to help. And that de delivery date will be Saturday, December 15th. So today, unbeknownst to myself, in my mailbox, I received this letter that says, City of Goodyear, Wally Campbell, 15068 West Pinchot Avenue, Goodyear, Arizona. As a board member at the Valentine Family Foundation, it is my privilege to get to designate donation funds to those causes with which I have a personal interest. To that end, please find enclosed check number 2709 in the amount of $5,000. These funds are intended for fill a need for you to use as you see fit. I appreciate the work you do for the community of Goodyear and wish you continued success. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Sincerely, um, Charlotte Salbrun on behalf of Nancy Popenhagen, who is a resident of Pebble Creek and a dear friend of mine. Well, so, Chief, ahead. here's your check. <laughs> You're welcome. That was a very nice surprise, and I didn't even ask for it. Well, I'll tell you what, you know the right people. All right, we're, we're ready for the city manager. Joe has something that he wants to ask you or yeah, the timing is kind of perfect. It kind of piggybacks on what Christopher had brought up tonight. In fact, code enforcement might already be working on it. And now that you gave me the timeline, I can understand it. But uh, the uh, Palm Valley Golf Course, the, um, what do you call it, the uh, um, part between the roadway and the sidewalk um, on Thomas, on Palm Valley Boulevard, uh, those, there's more green in spots where the stone is then there is stone. Now, I know in the past we've had to give them a call to take care of some of that stuff. Uh, but uh, And they, they may be working on it right now, but can somebody give them a call? You may already be working on it, Christopher. Give them a call to uh, try to get them to resolve that. Mayor, Council, um, excuse me for butting in, but I can answer this right now for everybody. The um, code has already been in contact with the property owner. It took place on November 28th. Okay, so thank it's you. in process. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christopher. All right, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So I did want to provide an update on the home plate for the holidays. Um, it kicked off the holiday season at Goodyear Ball Park and drew an estimated crowd of nearly 6,500 attendees, which is more than last year's attendance. Mm -hmm. The annual Christmas tree lighting was highlighted with Santa, of course, arriving to the stage with the crowd singing, Here Comes Santa Claus and Jingle Bells, and Mayor Lord leading the count and a beautiful fireworks display. We had 50 tons of snow and nonstop live entertainment on the stage provided by Anderson Institute of Music. Uh, we had many new items, including craft areas and new features at the kid zone, including a mechanical swing ride. A 15 foot snow globe was available for pictures and more than 200 children were able to visit with Santa in the team shop. Um, I think overall it was a, a wonderful success, and I do have to also plug the hot chocolate, which was, yes. uh, which oh, was yes. just spot the on. Hot chocolate was great. <laughs> well, go ahead, and when, we'll let her mention it. Go ahead, mention it right now. While she All right. Goes. I want to thank um, Nathan and Bruce for helping set up the, the hot chocolate booth at the historic Goodyear Litchfield Train Station Foundation sold hot chocolate, and it looks like we've made between four and five hundred dollars, but Sherilyn's going to count the money when I get it over to her. So thank you very much. It was wonderful. Go ahead, very Julie. tasty. Also wanted to provide an update to uh, Mayor Council and also to the public that we um, currently City Council meetings are streamed through the city's website. And beginning, we believe, if all works well with the December 17th meeting, we'll also be able to uh, stream our council meetings live through social media. And this will allow us to reach a wider audience and keep them informed of the decisions made by mayor and council. Uh, so we'll certainly be providing you with some additional information, but we look forward to uh, moving into the next uh, realm of our social media. 
And with that, I'd like to wish a happy Hanukkah to all of our residents and staff in the community in general. Thank you. Okay, anything else from anybody on the diet? Okay, and then the next meeting will be uh, January 7th, 2018 at five. Wow. Actually, it's that's December wrong. 17th. I think that's wrong. Okay, okay. 2019. Isn't that what they're saying? 20, 2019, oh, 2018, the 17th. Yeah, that's right. Okay, all right. On January 7th, let's put it there. Uh, no further business, we're adjourned. <laughs>